Uh, If you will, please stand, and uh, we're going to read our passage for today, so uh, please stand and join me for the reading of God's Word. The passage we're going to consider this morning is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. May God bless the reading and preaching of his word. Amen. You may be seated. Um, Today we're beginning a new five-week preaching series uh, on the passage that was just read, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16, and it concerns specifically the topic Christian holiness. Now, you may ask two questions. Uh, First of all, what is Christian holiness? And then second, why are we doing this? Why are we doing a five-week series on Christian holiness? Well, first of all, Christian holiness is a phrase that I'm going to use to describe the godlike life that followers of Jesus are called to live. The godlike life that followers of Jesus are called to live. And so why are we going to talk about this? Well, mainly because the salvation that Jesus brings us necessarily involves us living holy lives in response. There is an essential connection between our salvation by the grace of God salvation that is apart from any qualifying works that we do, and the life that we are called to live in response to that salvation, the life of kingdom works that we are to do in response. Let me just actually quote a couple of passages from Scripture that closely connect these two things, our salvation and the works and, or the holiness that result from it. The first one is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, 22 to 23. Jesus says there, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You see, first in verse 22, the sacrificial death uh, that Jesus uh, underwent in order to save us, God's grace, our salvation through that, but then the life of self-denial and following Christ, the life of holiness that is a result of that. Another passage, Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There you see, verses 8 and 9, salvation by grace, apart from any work that we would do, and then the result of that is the life of works, uh, a life of serving God as he has called us to live. You see the connections there. So from Scripture, it's very clear. We're saved by grace, apart from any work, and then we are called to live a life of good works towards God and his kingdom, a life of Christian holiness. And now I say this, and all of you might nod and agree, and all of us would say, yes, we see this in Scripture, but the problem is is that we have issues actually understanding this and living it out. Uh, And there are many potential issues that we have. Uh, One issue might be that we don't really understand the gospel, that salvation is apart from any work we do, and we might try to live a holy life in order to earn God's favor and to earn our salvation. That's one problem, but then there's another problem that's almost the opposite of that, And that is the problem that we might say, okay, we're saved by grace, we're in, we don't have to do anything now, we're all good, I can just live life how I want. That's another issue, another problem. Another problem we can have is some of us might be sincerely trying to obey Christ and to live a life of holiness, but we're doing so in our own power and strength and not relying on Christ and His Spirit. Also, we may be sincerely trying to obey, but we may be failing all the time, And we may be despairing because we're not seeing much growth. Uh, We don't know uh, know, what's happening and why we're not growing as we want to. Uh, And then finally, we might be trying 
to live a life of holiness, but doing so on our own, apart from the help of friends and of the church, uh, trying to do that by ourselves. And, and these are just some of the issues that we can have that we're going to be addressing over the next few weeks as we talk about this topic of Christian holiness. And so here's the outline of how we're going to go through these five weeks. Here are the titles of the five messages. Today we're going to talk about holiness through the gospel. And then next week we'll talk about the connection between holiness and grace. And then on the third week we'll talk about striving for holiness, then holiness and our sin, the reality of that, and then finally we'll talk about holiness in community, how we need one another. And so we're going to be in our passage, 1 Peter chapter 1, 13 to 16, uh, each week, but we'll be going to other passages as well to help enlighten us uh, on this study. And so here's what we're going to be looking at today. Here's the outline for today's sermon, which is on uh, the fact that holiness comes through the gospel of Jesus alone. Uh, three main sections for today. First, we'll talk about God's holiness And then we'll talk about our unholiness. And then finally, we'll talk about how we can receive holiness or be holy through the gospel. And so first, let's take a look at how God himself is holy. And to do that, let's go back to our passage in 1 Peter. Let me reread verses 15 to 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. All right, so we see here from 1 Peter that the call to holiness for us as Christians is based on the fact that God himself is holy. Now, what does that mean, that God is holy? How would we define God's holiness? Well, this is what uh, scholar, Old Testament scholar Bob Chisholm, uh, how he answers that question. He says, the Hebrew adjective kadosh, holy, refers to persons, places, and things which are distinct from the common or ordinary. When used in a religious sense, the term refers to person, places, and things which have been set apart for God's service. Now, when applied to God himself, the word refers primarily to his sovereign transcendence, meaning that he's above, that he's set apart, which sets him apart from all created beings. As the holy or sovereign one, he is morally perfect or self-consistent and possesses absolute moral authority over his creatures. Okay, when I read that definition, two things jumped out to me. And the first one is that God is morally perfect, not because he meets an external standard of moral perfection that is just out there. That's a very Greek idea, that there's this ideal standard, and that God himself would meet that standard uh, of, of holiness and moral perfection. No, you see, God himself is the standard. He is self-consistent, and he is holy in that sense by virtue of who he is. He is holy. He's perfect. And then the second thing that jumped out to me from that definition is that God's holiness is tied to his sovereignty over his creation. He is the transcendent ruler over all. And Isaiah the prophet in chapter 6, verse 5, when he sees God in all of his holiness revealed to him, Isaiah's response is, quote, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He immediately connects God's kingship with his holiness. And so if we put all this together, this is what we get about God. The fact that he is holy means that he's set apart or transcendent, like we sang earlier. He's the everlasting God. It also means he's morally perfect, and that's self-consistent. And it means that he's the sovereign king over all creation. Now, it's not up on the screen, but one other thing I would add is that there is a connection between God's holiness and His love, because the New Testament especially talks about how to fulfill all the law. It's love, love of God, love of neighbor. That fulfills the law, which is the revelation of God's character and His holiness, and so there is a connecting point between love and holiness with regard uh, to God's character. Now, in God's sovereignty, as the holy God, He decrees or he has commanded that all of his creations are to be holy as he is holy. And he says it lots of places. Let's just look at it. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 2. Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Here God is calling 
his people to holiness. Now, obviously, we cannot be holy exactly like God is holy because we are his creations. We are not transcendent like he is, okay? But we are called to mimic or to reflect his holiness as best we can. And to illustrate this, I remembered uh, when, I was, when I was working through this sermon, I remembered when I was a, a kid, I used to play baseball. And I remember in order to try to be the best hitter I could be <clears throat> when I got a chance to hit, I would mimic or copy some of my favorite Major League Baseball players. And in one particular stage of my childhood baseball career, my favorite player was Atlanta Braves center fielder Dale Murphy. And so I, whenever I got up to hit, I would do everything that Dale Murphy did when he got into the batter's box. I would step into the box just like he did. I would take my warm-up swings just like he did, two short strokes, and then you know, getting ready like this. And then whenever the ball would come, I would swing just like he did. I did best I could to, to mimic and to imitate Dale Murphy. Well, God is calling his people to do something similar to that. He calls us to live a life that reflects his character. And specifically, he calls us to be set apart for him and to live as he's called us to live. And For Israel, what this meant is following all the standards that God laid out for them uh, in the law. And and in the the New Testament, what we see is that is is fulfilled in what we talked about earlier, love, in love of God and love of neighbor. And so that's what we are called to do, to, to fulfill God's requirements for us, to love God, to love neighbor, to be holy as God is holy. So all this sounds great, right? God is holy. He calls us to be holy, to reflect his character. So let's go be holy. Preaching series over. Done. Next topic. But not so fast. Because there's a problem. You see, we can't be holy as God is holy. You know, I, I could mimic Dale Murphy all day long, okay? When I got up there to hit, I would swing like he swung, but whenever... I played, if I hit the ball, which usually I didn't, but if I actually hit the ball, it would not jump off of my bat like it jumped off of Dale Murphy's bat when he would hit all his home runs, okay? When I hit the ball, it would sort of dribble out towards shortstop, or if I really got a hold of it, I would fly out to right, okay? I could not hit like Dale Murphy. Do you know why? I was Danny. (laughs) And in a very similar way, We cannot be holy like God is holy because we are not God. And because we are not God, we fail to meet that standard of holiness that God has set for us. We can't be holy as he's holy. And that leads to the next section of the sermon, our unholiness. And I want to make three important points about our unholiness. First, we are all unholy without God's intervention. All of us. Let me read from the passage I alluded to earlier, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. In this passage, Isaiah the prophet, uh, notice his reaction as he uh, sees God in his holiness. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When Isaiah sees God in his holiness, how does he respond? I'm I'm lost. Woe is me. I'm I'm unclean. And everybody else around me is unclean. In other words, Isaiah is, is saying, I'm unholy. And so is everyone else. And that is exactly what Scripture teaches us over and over again, that that we, all people, are unholy. And it comes not just from the fact that we're human. It comes from the fact that the first human, the first man, Adam, 
sinned against God, rebelled against him, and his, uh, his nature, his, his sinful nature is, is passed on to all of us, and we just verify it by continuing to sin and rebel against God. And so that's point one. All of us are unholy. Second point, our unholiness is a big deal. It means that we are under condemnation. Because of our unholiness, the Bible tells us that we are under God's wrath. We see it in both Testaments, in the Old Testament. For example, Exodus 34, verse 7, it says that God will by no means clear the guilty. There has to be punishment for sin. That's why there was a sacrificial system, so that sin would be covered. That's what God's holiness requires. And then in the New Testament, Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. He says, the wages of sin is death. Now, wages, what are wages? That's what we earn, right? If you have a job, you earn wages, a paycheck for what you do. Well, same thing with sin. Our our pay are the result of what uh, our sinning, our rebellion against God is death. And that's not just physical death. That's eternal separation from God and eternity apart from Him in hell. And so we're all unholy, and it's a big deal. We are all, because of our unholiness, under condemnation. Finally, a third point is there is no escape from this condemnation apart from Jesus Christ. There's no escape. You know, God won't just let us off the hook. He can't because He is holy and our sin must be punished. And this is why, by the way, many, you can't argue this, but many will argue that there are many paths to God, that all different philosophies and religions will ultimately lead to God, and there's really ultimately no difference between Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, uh, the other philosophies and religions. They're all different paths to God. That's a very common view. They're all the same. But I hope you see the problem with this view in our passage this morning. It is that all these other views fail to account for God's holiness and our unholiness. Religions will argue that if you do these particular things, you will get to God, the eightfold path, the the five pillars, if you're moral and you're good. But the problem with those approaches is that, yeah, we can go and do good things, we can philosophically live a consistent life, but we're still unholy. We still have the problem of sin, and those good things won't take care of that. They won't cover the, the sin that we have. I must be punished for them. And then the scriptures tell us that there's only one path to God, specifically through the Lord Jesus Christ. Only through him is our sin dealt with. Peter put it this way, there's salvation in no one else in Acts chapter 4. So do you see the three points about our unholiness? This condition that we are in before the holy God, the, the peril that we face? We are all unholy. We are all under condemnation, and there's no escape. You know, early American pastor and theologian Jonathan Edwards really understood this. In his very famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, Edwards articulated the peril that we face in a very powerful way. And what I want to do is just read to you the ten main points from Edwards' sermon, because I think they help us feel the force of our unholiness and our peril before God and help us understand how beautiful and wonderful the gospel is. So let me just read you his points. Point one in his sermon is, there is no want of power in God to cast us into hell at any moment. No one can withstand God's judgment. And by us there, that's all of us. It's not just the really bad people who murder and are really awful. No, it's everyone. All of us are in that predicament and none of us can escape God's judgment. You know, sometimes the bad guys can get away from the, uh, the police, but none of us will escape God's justice. Point two, we deserve to be cast into hell. We talked about that. Three, we are already under a sentence of condemnation to hell. Point four, we are now the objects of that very same anger and wrath of God that is expressed in the torments of hell. Fifth, the devil stands ready to fall upon us and seize us as his own. Sixth, there is in us those hellish principles reigning that would presently kindle and flame out 
into hell fire. Seventh, it is no security to us for one moment that there are no visible means of death at hand. Eighth, our prudence and care to preserve our own lives or the care of others to preserve them don't secure them one moment. Nine, all our pains and contrivance we use to escape hell while we continue to reject Christ don't secure us from hell one moment. Tenth, God has laid himself under no obligation by any promise to keep any natural man out of hell one moment. And now I want to quote Edwards because at the end of his sermon, he directly addresses his audience having made these points. And this is what he says. And I'm going to read the extended quote and I'm going to pause for a minute to kind of let it sink in. Edwards says, Your wickedness makes you, as it were, heavy as lead, and to tend downwards with great weight and pressure toward hell. And if God should let you go, you would immediately sink and swiftly descend and plunge into the bottomless gulf. And your healthy constitution and your own care and prudence and best contrivance and all your righteousness would have no more influence to uphold you and keep you out of hell than a spider's web would have to stop a falling rock. Were it not that so is the sovereign pleasure of God, the earth would not bear you one moment, for you are a burden to it. The creation groans with you. The creation is made subject to the bondage of your corruption, not willingly, The sun doesn't willingly shine upon you to give you light to serve sin and Satan. The earth doesn't willingly yield her increase to satisfy your lusts, nor is it willingly a stage for your wickedness to be acted upon. The air doesn't willingly serve you for breath to maintain the flame of life in your vitals while you spend your life in the service of God's enemies, and the world would spew you out were it not for the sovereign hand of him who hath subjected it in hope. There are the black clouds of God's wrath now hanging directly over your heads, full of the dreadful storm and big with thunder. And were it not for the restraining hand of God, it would immediately burst forth upon you. The sovereign pleasure of God for the present stays his rough wind, otherwise it would come with a fury and your destruction would come like a whirlwind, and you would be like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. Thank God for the gospel. In the gospel, God, apart from any work that we have done, has saved sinners and given us forgiveness and new life through faith in Jesus. I'm going to read a little further down in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. You were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. You see the aspects of the gospel here in 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19. We're sinners. We're unholy, deserving of condemnation. Uh, We we walked in the futile ways that we inherited from our fathers, but we're saved apart from any work we've done. We can't buy it with silver or gold. We have nothing to offer. It's God. He's the one who ransomed us, and he ransomed us specifically through the innocent blood of Jesus You see, this is how we are able to be holy. It's through what God did for us through Jesus. Because, you see, Jesus, unlike us, is holy. He perfectly obeyed his Father. And because of that, and because he died for us, God saves us. Because when Jesus died, he was taking the punishment for sin we deserved. That that wrath of God, that, that Edwards, that we just read about from Jonathan Edwards a minute ago, that fell on Christ for us. 
It fell on Jesus, you see. And because of that, we now, by faith, turn to Jesus and we are saved, we are forgiven, and we are made holy by him. Again, it's not because of anything we've done, but because of God's mercy to us in Jesus. When we believe in him, our sin is taken away. His holiness is given to us. You know what the gospel is like? It's like what happens in the Jane Austen novel, Pride and Prejudice. If you've read the book, you know that there's a man with five unmarried daughters, and his daughters are not going to be able to inherit his home. And in fact, once the father dies, all of them are going to be left to their own means. They're going to be somewhat destitute. And of course, the book is about how those daughters are able to get out of that situation through uh, good marriages, through, through profitable marriages. And so the book tells the story of how these daughters get married. And the most significant, or the, or the most significant of the daughters in the story is a woman named Elizabeth Bennett. Elizabeth in the story goes from being destined to having a life of poverty to being incredibly rich by the end of the story. Now, how does that happen? It happens through the love of Mr. Darcy, right? Uh, Darcy uh, falls in love with her, and through her marriage to Darcy, she is able to be rich. She lives at Pemberley and gets all the riches that are involved in living there. Well, I think that's a great illustration of what is happening in the gospel, except it's way better <laughs> than, than, uh, than a marriage to Mr. Darcy, okay? Uh, listen, we had a, a horrible future. We just read about it in, in the quote from Edwards. We were destined to undergo God's wrath. But that horrible future has been taken away and replaced with great riches. We are made rich through marriage to Christ by faith in Him. And, and we no longer have the prospect of hell, but now we have the prospect of eternal life. And not only eternal life in the future, but we have a changed life now. We have new life because of what God has done for us through Jesus, we are now able to live the holy life that God has called us to live. And that leads us to an important question, which is the last matter for the sermon today. And the question is this, what type of holiness have we been given through the gospel? Or what are the aspects of the holiness that we've been given in the gospel? And there are three. We have been given positional, progressive, and future holiness. Let me speak briefly about each of them. First, positional holiness. We are, we are given that. Uh, this aspect of holiness is what we were just discussing. When we are united to Christ by faith, we are given His holiness. It is credited to us so that now when God looks at us, He doesn't see our sinful record. He sees Jesus' perfect righteous record, and Jesus' holiness is credited to us. And that is something that will never change. It's permanent. Even when we as Christians sin, God still sees the holiness of Jesus when he sees us. And in fact, there is a word in the New Testament that is used to describe followers of Jesus. The word is saint. That word reflects our positional holiness to God. Now, the word saint, that is not referring to uh, really important, dead, uh, Catholic Christians, uh, and it is also not referring to a football team in New Orleans. It is referring to those of us who have positional holiness in Jesus, those of us who are in Christ. And so that's one aspect of our holiness, positional holiness. We are saints before God. Second aspect is progressive holiness. That is the life of increasing practical holiness that we have as Christians in response to and empowered by God's grace in Jesus. You see, when we become Christians, we don't stop sinning, unfortunately. That would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, but we do. We have this sin nature that still resides within us. And so, as we grow as Christians, uh, we are moving toward being less and less committed to our sin nature and more and more committed to loving, following, and obeying Jesus. Uh, it's, our pr it's our progressive holiness, and it, it flows out of our positional holiness, uh, but this progressive holiness is how we live as Christians, and it's what we're going to be talking about for the next four sermons. They're really going to be all about our progressive holiness. But before I move on to the final aspect of holiness, I want to make two important statements about progressive holiness. The first one is this. Progressive holiness is a necessary companion to positional holiness. 
You can't have one without the other. You can't have progressive holiness without positional holiness. If you try to go and live a different life that's a holy life to God without ever uh, putting your faith in Jesus Christ, then you are not going to be holy. You, you can't do that because you're still in your sin. You, you're, you're still unholy. You don't have that right standing before God. And so you have to have positional holiness before you go and have progressive holiness. And you know what? The opposite is true as well. You can't have positional holiness without progressive holiness. If you are someone who claims to be a Christian and your life is no different than it was before you became a Christian or no different than than anyone else in the world out there who is not a believer, then the New Testament gives you no assurance of your salvation. Because these two things necessarily go together. These two statements I'm going to make are both true. Salvation, or positional holiness, is by grace, apart from any work. But our progressive holiness is a result. Well, let me say it differently. Salvation without any progressive holiness is no salvation at all. It's no salvation at all. I'll quote Walter Marshall. This is what he says about progressive holiness. Great multitudes of ignorant people that live under the gospel harden their hearts in sin and ruin their souls forever by trusting on Christ for such an imaginary salvation as does not consist at all in holiness, but only in forgiveness of sin and deliverance from everlasting torments. They would be free from the punishment due to sin, but they love their lust so well that they hate holiness and would not be saved from the service of sin. None can trust on Christ for true salvation except they trust on Him for holiness. Neither do they heartily desire true salvation if they do not desire to be made holy and righteous in their hearts and lives. If God and Christ give you salvation, holiness will be a part of it. So that's the first thing about progressive holiness. It necessarily goes with our positional holiness. You can't have one without the other. And then the second thing, progressive holiness, just like positional holiness, comes through the grace of God in Christ. Now that's not to say that we don't put forth effort. In fact, we put forth great effort in pursuing holiness. But we will not be able to have any long-term change in our lives without the grace of God at work in us. In fact, all of our, effort, all of our efforts without that will be towards self-righteousness and will be hypocritical. And so we're going to talk about next week in the sermon the, the essential connection between holiness and grace. So that's progressive holiness. Now, the final aspect of the holiness that God has given us is future holiness. Peter said it in our text, uh, 1 Peter 1, 13, he said, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that phrase, at the revelation of Jesus Christ, refers to when uh, we will be with Christ uh, in his presence after our death, and then when he returns and we receive new resurrection bodies and, and, and new incorruptible bodies, and there will be no more sin and no more death. That is the final holiness that we will experience in the presence of Jesus forever with him, and all will be as God has intended it to be. So, how do we respond to what we've seen here about holiness in First Peter chapter 1? I'm going to suggest three responses. First, trust Jesus to make you holy. If you're here and you've never put your trust in Christ, um, maybe you've been trying to be a good person, uh, trying to do your best, uh, earn uh, God's acceptance by your holy living, uh, what your your efforts, your your attempt to clean up your life, to turn it around. In fact, maybe that's why you've come to church and you started coming to church in order to to sort of make your life right before God. Earn his favor by your efforts. Well, if that's where you're at, I have some bad news and some good news for you. The bad news is that you're under the wrath of God. You're unholy. And as Edward says, the only reason that you're not in hell already is because of God's mercy. But the good news 
is that God has done what you can't do. He has made you holy through Jesus Christ, through his son. Jesus was holy like God, and he died to pay for your sins. And your response is to come to him in faith, to acknowledge your sin, your unholiness, to receive the gift of his salvation, and to live a life in response to that. And so trust in Jesus to save you. You can do that through prayer by asking God to save you. Please come talk to me or one of the elders who are here down front. We'd love to talk to you more about what it means to trust Jesus to make you holy. That's your very first response. And then if you are a follower of Christ, a second response is that you are to know that you are a saint, that you have positional holiness, that you stand in the righteousness of Jesus. Know that he has made you rich, much richer than, than a, a Elizabeth Bennett at Pemberley. You have the riches of an inheritance that will never pass away. Let that truth give you confidence before God. Let it draw you to worship in him, to draw you to serve him, to live for him. Know that you're a saint. Feel the force of that and let that sink in and and change your life. And then finally, a third response is that if you claim to be a Christian, but you have no progressive holiness, if you are not growing in your love for God, in your love for others, in your desire to to obey Him, to serve Him, not again, not, not means you're not perfect, that's not what I'm saying, but if you are not growing in godliness and in holiness, then repent. Because the salvation that God gives is a salvation that necessarily is, it, uh, comes along with progressive holiness. And so your response to this sermon is to say, God, I have wanted salvation on my terms. I repent of that. I ask you to forgive me. Please change me. And ask him to change your heart. Ask him to, to save you in a true sense so that you, uh, he's making you into the person that he wants you to be and and make every effort to do so. Next week, we're going to continue by looking at how progressive holiness comes through God's grace. If you will, please stand with me and let's close in prayer and we'll sing a song of response. Our Father, we, your church, declare that you are holy that there is none like you, that you are the the sovereign king and that you demand holiness from us. We confess that we are unholy and that the only confidence we can have is the holiness that you give us in Jesus. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for what you've done for us in Christ. Help us to live appropriately in response to it. And we pray this And we celebrate the name of Jesus together. Amen.